Okay, chapter time is very important and uh, it's also quite interesting. Um, so um, it's really important. Um, so even though this is our last lecture, I hope you still uh, can uh, pay a good attention to this uh, lecture. Okay, how many people do we have today? Oh, 30. Oh, that's a good attendance, 30. Um, so chapter 10 is about applications of fair values to non-current assets, okay? Applications of fair values to non-current assets. Okay, uh, so we wanna talk about the re-evaluation re -evaluation model, okay? Uh, most previously we talked about cost model, right? So the non-current asset is reported at the historical cost. That's the cost you have paid for, right? When you initially uh, acquire the asset. So this is a different model called revaluation model. Okay, that's the alternative to the cost model. And then the second is about um, impairment. Okay, so. Um, the eyesight's value may decrease over the time, okay? Um, so anytime on the financial reporting, the carrying amount of the eyesight, okay? If that amount does not reflect the uh, fair value, okay? Maybe there is the impairment test, okay? The first question is, should you test it? Second, if you test it, is there impairment? Okay, and then last, what is the amount of the impairment loss? Okay, so when we talk about impairment testing, I'm gonna talk about these three steps here. Um, we are going to also talk about the impairment testing. There are different rules for different types of non-current assets, right? In terms of intangible assets, with the indefinite useful life versus um, those intangible assets with no, with finite uh, useful life, okay? So different types of non-current assets, the rules for impairment testing may be different, okay? If we have time, I'm gonna talk about the investment property, okay? Um, so they also have uh, asset held for sale and discontinued operation. Make sure you read this, this uh, uh, information from a textbook on your own if I'm not able to cover it, okay? Um, this is our focus. Our focus is about re-evaluation model and impairment testing. These are very, very important topics, okay? But this topic is also important, but I don't have time to cover all of them. So make sure you will spend your, your own time to read about investment properties, agricultural activities, and assets held for sale and discontinued operation. Our focus today is the first three, okay? So uh, efforts allows both model, historical cost model and fair value model, okay? Fair value model. The benefit of the historical cost model is it's easier, simpler, right? So basically there's a invoice, right? The cost, and you always reported the cost, right? And you recognize uh, depreciation every year, right? So that's easy for the cost model, right? Uh, I first also permit a fair value basis models, okay? Why? Remember, in the earlier chapters, we talked about the relevancy, right? And we talked about the trade-off between relevancy and reliability. Remember the examples I gave? The Vancouver land, right? Cost you $10 million, uh, $1 million, not worth $10 million, right? And we agreed that the fair value, the $10 million is more relevant to the decision-making, right? But it's less reliable if you remember that. So fair value, okay, provides more relevant information. You can see the rationales behind why IFRS allows fair value model, right? It does provide the relevant information to the information user. Um, oops. 
However, however, the impairment need to be assessed. Okay, the impairment need to be assessed. So fair value may change dramatically. Okay, so you have to be able to make assessment on the change if the value ha has declined. Right, that's called impairment. SV, okay, SV does not permit reevaluation. Okay, so the model we are learning today here is only for efforts. SV does not permit reevaluation. Okay, so what is reevaluation model? Okay, so reevaluation model under this model, okay, we're gonna restate the carrying value of an asset to the asset's fair value on the date of revaluation. Okay, on the date of revaluation. So, what is fair value? Okay, fair value uh, is talking about there's a market, there's a market participants, there are some ordinary transactions. Okay, other orderly transactions. So the price. Uh, under this in this market would be the fair value okay would be the fair value okay this model revaluation model can be applied to tangible asset ppe property plant equipment and also intangible assets and also intangible assets so now let me ask you a question oh for if you haven't get um, five participation mark yet today tonight we still count the participation mark okay so make sure if you need one more make sure you participate so um let me ask you a question in chapter seven we learned about financial assets right okay do you remember the measurement model for financial assets because here we are saying um you know the cost model and revaluation model can be used, applied to PPE and the intangible assets. Don't forget, we also have a financial assets category. So do you remember in chapter seven? Okay. What, what are the measurement models for financial assets? Anyone? I assume that you all get your participation mark. So you don't have to answer. <laughs> so like the fair value through profits and loss or the fair value through other... Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah very good. Okay. So FVPL, FVOCI, right? And amortize the cost, right? For those non-strategic investment, right? Remember, there are three uh, models, right? FVPL, FVOCI, and amortize the cost, okay? For the st strategic investment, uh, you have, you have uh, you know, subsidiaries, right? Joint ventures, joint controls, right? You have uh, associate, and depending on the type of the uh, relationship, uh, you, you either use consolidation, right? Partial consolidation, or you use equity method, right? Remember, those are the measurement models for financial assets. Very good. Uh, so, so for PPE, tangible asset and intangible asset, you could use cost model and revaluation model under efforts, okay? The enterprise can choose either cost model or revaluation model. If fair value cannot be reliably measured, you, you, you need to use cost model, right? So the rationale here is, the reason why efforts allow fair value reporting is because fair value provide relevant information, right? If the fair value cannot be reliably measured, right? Then that information is not relevant because it's not reliable, right? If it's not reliable, then you can't report a fair value that is not reliable. So therefore you have to use cost model. 
Okay, you haven't used cost model. Um, so for intangible assets, right? I want you to think about the intangible assets. Can you give me an example that uh, a intangible assets whose fair value can be reliably measured? And then give me one example, a uh, intangible asset whose fair value is not, cannot be reliably measured. Doesn't land have one, not something that can be uh, reliably measured? Uh, land is tangible asset. Uh, you can measure it using appraisal, right? Appraisal. So I, I would say it, it can be reasonably um, measured with reliability, right? For land. Um, maybe something that couldn't get reliably measured is like a new software program that helps update another one. It might be, you know, hard to put a fair value on that. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of a broad uh -huh. example. Yeah. Do you sell those? Do you sell those softwares, right? If you, if those softwares is uh, is is in the market, then there may be maybe a price for that, right? There may be a price for that. So how much do you pay for turbo tax, right? Uh, to report your personal tax, right? There's a value, there's a price for that. Um, oh. Yeah. Would goodwill be an example? Uh, goodwill, okay, yeah, goodwill. Intangible yeah. assets, is goodwill an intangible asset? Yeah. No. Or no, 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 no okay. it isn't, no. <laughs> yeah, so that's something oh. I really emphasize from previous, um, goodwill is not the intangible asset, right? So the examples I have for you is, for intangible assets, right? Production quota, right? Um, so if you live in Alberta, right? You know that we have a lot of farmers. A lot of the farming uh, industry is based on quota, right? So, um, you know, the government allow maybe let's say 1 million uh, chicken, uh, chicken quota, right? For the whole province. And then, um, you know, if you want to grow chicken, if you want to set up your chicken chicken farm, you have if you, let's say you want to grow sixty thousand chicken chickens in your, on your farm, then you have to buy this quota, right? This quota is is the legal rights to uh, to grow this much, um, you know, uh, the chickens. Okay, there is a price. There is a market price for a quota for chicken. For example, um, if you grow chicken for meat for McDonald's, right? Maybe the quota would be $150 for each chicken, okay? So my friend has a chicken farm with 60,000 chickens, right? So think about the investment. So 150 times 60, so how much? So if it's six, 9,000. Uh, is that nine million dollars or nine hundred? It's either nine million or nine hundred thousand, right? I think it's nine million. No, no, nine hundred thousand. But anyways, it's a big investment, right? So this is not talking about having a farm, right? Just talking about your legal right to raise chicken, right? Um, just by the production quota. So this would be an intangible assets, right? The production quota. And, uh, and it has a fair market price. So you can measure this quota with, with reliability, right? So this would be a case that intangible asset can be measured reliably, okay? Uh, and then you think about patent or trademarks, right? There's no, they are so unique, right? You think about the, the trademark for, uh, let's say, uh, Starbucks, right? That's so unique. There's only one Starbucks patent trademark, right? How are you gonna measure this, the value of that, right? So you can see that certain intangible assets may be uh, reliably measured, others may not, right? Okay, this is just give you an example for you to see, um, you know, in certain case, you probably have to use cost model because you are not able to measure your uh, fair value reliably, okay? Okay, so subsequent to initial recognition, okay? 
the revalued amount equals the fair value at the revaluation date minus subsequent amortization, the sub subsequent uh, cumulative depreciation, and the minus subsequent impair cumulative impairment loss. Okay, so that will be the revalued amount. We're going to see more later on. You do not have to require, do not have to evaluate every year. This is a revaluation model, but there's no requirement you have to do this annually, okay? What's the frequency, okay? What's the regular, like, regularity? So that's really depending on the type of the eyesight, okay? So for example, land in Vancouver, right? Do you think you should evaluate the, the value of the land in Vancouver annually? No. No? Why not? We, um, because it's like, you kind of, unless there's some sort of, uh, dramatic change or something, but it's, it's pretty much the same year, year round. Okay. So, yeah. So if you live in Vancouver, you will know that the, the, the housing price is even going up 10% this year in the midst of the COVID-19. Okay. So the, the question I was asking is that I think the, the land value appreciated quite very quickly in Vancouver compared to Alberta, right? Um, maybe it's because of it's a favorite location for uh, lots of immigrants, right? They came to Canada, they decided to live in uh, Fraser Valley. Uh, they either rent or they buy their own house, right? So the, that really created a huge demand for uh, real estate, right? And, uh, you know, there's only limited areas in the Fraser Valley, right? Uh, the supply of the housing is limited, right? So the land price go up much, much quicker than in Alberta elsewhere in Canada, right? So um, if you say the land value in Alberta, maybe you don't have to evaluate, uh, evaluate it every year, but the, if the price changed very quickly, right? If the market price changed very quickly and dramatically, that, that may be the reason we probably need to um, visit this fair value more uh, frequently, more regularly, right? So it's really depending on the type of the, 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 the eyesight, okay? That's the point I want to make. Uh, you have to apply this uh, assessment revaluation consistently to the eyesight in the same class, right? So if you have, um, you know, a land in uh, in Burnaby, right? If you have a land in Surrey, and uh, then you decide to reevaluate the land in Burnaby, but choose to leave the land in Surrey out, that doesn't make sense because the land in Surrey and the lands in Burnaby, they are very similar nature, right? They should be belong to the same class group, right? They are they both land, right? And they are very close to each other. Um, so you can't just cherry pick on the eyesight, right? If you decide to reevaluate the land, you better reevaluate the whole class, right? Instead of picking individual eyesights, right? Does this make sense? Yes. 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 Okay. So this is all this um, conceptual kind of uh, payment for the uh, calculations you're gonna see in the later slides. We're gonna do some problems, okay? Okay, so um, adjustment, adjusting uh, assets value for revaluation, okay? For assets not subject to depreciation, that would be like land, right? All amortization, which is eyesight not subject to amortization? When we say amortization is about the intangible eyesight, which intangible eyesight is not subject to amortization? Patents. Yeah, patents, remember? Yeah, very good. Uh, last lecture we mentioned the patents is, can be uh, renewed every 15 years, right? So if you assume they, they will keep renewing it, the patents will have indefinite useful life 
uh, therefore it's not uh, subject to amortization. Okay, for this kind of assets, you adjust the carrying value, record the adjustment through profit or loss through the income statement. So, sorry, anyone have a question? Sorry, no, it was just a background, music, um, background noise. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, so, so if it's like land patent, you adjusting the carrying value, okay? And then you record the gain or loss through income statement, okay? If the asset is subject to depreciation, depreciable assets or amortization, the question is, right? Because you have two accounts, right? For assets at any time, for the depreciable assets, you have two accounts, right? One is cost account. The other one is cumulative depreciation account. Depreciation. Yeah, right? So now how are you gonna make the adjustment? Are you gonna adjust just the cost account, leaving the cumulative depreciation account alone? Or you, you do this one, leaving this alone, or you do both, right? There are different ways to do this, right? So the two methods I'm gonna introduce is proportional method, all elimination method, okay? That's the two acceptable method when you make an adjustment uh, to the eyesight. Proportional method, all elimination method, okay? So proportion, proportional method, this is the method, okay? Adjust both accounts, the cost, cumulative depreciation account, adjust the both account by the same percentage, okay? By the same percentage. And your end goal is after the adjustment, the difference between the two account, which is an adjusted carrying amount, reflects the fair value on the revaluation date, okay? Elimination method, Eliminating, elimination method, this is, interesting, you are going to eliminate the cumulative depreciation account, okay? Get rid of that account. That's called the elimination method. You're gonna write off this cumulative depreciation account and make adjustment through the cost account, okay? This may not be quite intuitive. Let's work on a problem. Let's work on a problem. Okay, so suppose an equipment with a net carrying amount of 80,000 has gross carrying value of 120,000 and a cumulative, cumulated depreciation of 40,000. Okay, this is pretty clear, right? The cost account has a balance of 120. The accumulative de depreciation account has a balance of 40. So the carrying value is the difference, which is 80, right? Now, the company estimate the fair value of the equipment has increased to 100,000. Okay, what should we do under both method? Okay, what should we do under both method? Oh, thank you, Arlene. I appreciate you turn on the camera which make me feel like I'm not lonely. Otherwise I'm just talking to all the names. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was wondering how come nobody wants to turn on camera today? Um, so, um, and so then in this question, so what kind of adjustment I need to make, right? So the carrying amount is 80,000, but the fair value is 20,000 more, right? 20,000 more. So I have to make adjustment. So under proportional method, okay, I want to figure it out. Oh, thank you, another camera is on. So, oh, thank you. This is our last class, okay. <laughs> um, so the ratio of the cumulative depreciation, okay, to cost that have to remain the same, okay. So I want to calculate the ratio, right? So in order to increase from 80 to 100, 
So that the amount of increase is 20, okay? So I have to increase by 20K so that I can go from 80 to 100. So what's the ratio? The ratio is 20 divided by 80, which is 25%. So the increase is 25%, okay? So I'm gonna apply this ratio to both cost and the cumulative uh, depreciation account, okay? So why do equipment, right? Increase in the cost count. I'm going to debit the equipment by 120 times 25%, which is 30K, okay? Similarly, I'm doing the same thing for the cumulative depreciation. I will credit the 10,000. The 10,000 comes from the balance of 40,000 times the same ratio, 25%. So that's 10K, okay? So now I need an additional what? Credit, right? I need additional credit. So that'll be my gain, right? That'll be my gain. So I credit OCI on the revaluation plus, surplus, 20,000. Now, after adjustment, the cost is, the cost is 115, right? So 120 plus 30. So after the adjustment, the total cost account balance is 150. What about the cumulative depreciation? You start with 40 plus 10, now it's 50, right? So this one is 150, the cost is 150. The cumulative depreciation is 50. So the difference is 100. And that's the number you want, right? That's the number you want. Does this make sense? Sorry, how did you get the 25% again? Mm -hmm. So I want to see the percentage of the increase. So right. uh, from 80, I wanted it to be 100. I need to increase 20, uh, oh. equivalent to 25%. So 25% okay, yeah. uh, of 80 is 20, is 20, right? Okay, thank you. Does this make sense? Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, so the 20,000 is going through the uh, profits and loss or other comprehensive income. So that means it's going to reflect in that year's uh, net income. Is that? No, it, it goes through. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk more about this, okay? So for now, just know that the treatment I'm doing for this one, for the cost account and the community free cumulative depreciation count. This one, we're gonna talk more about this, okay? I wanna leave it for now. I don't wanna confuse you. Once All we right, talk that slide, I'm gonna explain this, okay? But does that make sense in terms of the calculation of these two numbers? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Now, for elimination method, this under this method, you have to get rid of the cumulative depreciation account. What's my entry to get rid of that? So the balance right now is 40,000. What's my entry to get rid of this? Debit, uh, accumulated depreciation. Thank you. And yeah. Oops. So you debit accumulative depreciation for 40,000, right? Uh, because this account, cumulative depreciation, this account has a credit 40,000 balance to close it, to eliminate it. You have to debit for the same amount, right? Which is, you debit cumulative depreci uh, depreciation, 40,000. For equipment, right, for equipment, right now, the equipment, the, the, the cost account is 120, right? The cost account balance is 120. How can you make it to 100? You credit equipment for 20,000, right? So you start with 120, when you credit 20, now after adjustment, that's the 100. That's what you want, right? So now I need a credit, right? I need additional credit. See, that's the 20,000, okay? That's the 20,000. The idea is both result the same net carrying amount, right? So the 20, 20, the gain here, okay? Did you see, does this make sense? Elimination method, does this make sense? 
Yes. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. When uh, when would a comp like, what's the advantage, like when companies use each of these methods, which is the advantage? Like, is it better to use one method versus another or just preference? I think, I think you can use either, right? Um, so under this method, um, so basically you can see that it's not mathematically exactly not the same. easier Maybe it's mathematically, maybe it's easier to go with elimination method, right? You just get rid of, you know, this account, close it to be zero and make adjustment just through the cost count, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't have a, a better answer to your question. Yeah, mm -hmm. these That's are okay. the two methods available. Um, right. Yeah, but it's a good question, right? You know, you know, why people would use one versus the other, okay? Because one limit, like, sorry, the reason I asked is because one totally eliminates the accumulated depreciation, whereas the other one builds it up. But yeah, okay. Have a good. Um, you, well, well, this one you didn't totally eliminate it, right? Um, once you have a new number, your equipment will be 100. You have to keep recording the depreciation until okay. the next revaluation date. Oh, so it's like you whenever you're doing the, the entry, you have to... It yeah. just refreshes itself. Yeah, it just uh, reset this account to zero, right? Okay. So for every revaluation uh, date, uh, under this method, you reset this balance to be zero, right? Um, but after that, you 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 keep you know record this recording uh, depreciation. Yeah, until next. Okay. It's, yeah. So you, it's not like you have no account like this anymore. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are we clear with the two different method? Okay, so I will move on. Okay, um, so the account, the accounting effect for the uh, revaluation on equity, right? Uh, so basically, it's really depending on whether the revaluation is upward or downward, right? Do you have a valuation surplus or you have a loss, right? And it depends on what past revaluations has been done for the same asset. And you'll be thinking like what I'm talking about, right? So I'm hoping to explain that using this, this graph, okay? So the treatment of a revaluation adjustment is asymmetric, okay? So basically the surplus, okay? If you credit this surplus, that goes to OCI, other comprehensive exam, does not go through income statement, okay? But if it's a loss, cumulative loss, that can go to through the income statement, okay? Before I go any further, let me ask you, why do you think accounting standard causing this asymmetric um, treatment? Why don't they just run both surplus and loss all through income statement? They're trying to avoid earnings management. Thank you, Arlene. That's the perfect answer. So they don't want managers, okay, to increase their earnings, which is on the income statement, right? By revaluation through revaluation plus surplus, okay? Well, you could recognize loss, okay? It's okay if the company recognize loss, okay? But if you recognize earnings, the accounting standard is concerned people overstate their earnings, okay? Therefore, if it's a revaluation surplus, it goes to the equity directly, does not go through the income, okay? But if it's a loss, that's okay. You can go through the, um, go through the um, income statement, okay? So basically the idea is if you have cumulative surplus, okay? So then nothing will go to the income statement, okay? If you have cumulative surplus, until if you follow this uh, dashed line, the curve here. Um, so the uh, vertical axis represent cumulative, okay? Cumulative um, adjustment. So only, only, okay, you have no cumulative surplus left. That's the time you can recognize the loss on the income statement. Okay. If 
And now if you follow the solid blue line, okay, this is the opposite. They have a cumulative loss position in the previous years. So you can only recognize the OCI after you get after you get out of this pit. Okay. You have to get out of this, this pit, okay, before you can recognize it um, as a OCI um, valuation surplus. Okay. I hope this makes sense. Okay. Does anyone have any question? This graph, um, is this just when you reevaluate re like the asset or is this actually a sale of the asset? Uh, revaluation. Okay. This is about the revaluation, not about the sales. Okay. Mm -hmm. For sales of eyesight, okay. For sales of eyesight, um, we realize the gain on the income statement, right? If you sell the tangible asset, is that is that true? When you sell a tangible asset, the you really you recognize the gain on the income statement, right? Okay. I think so. Okay, yeah. yeah. But this yeah. is different, right? Revaluation is different. This is not about disposal. Okay. The, the idea is what about the manager realize they have low earnings? Oh, my earnings is low. I cannot meet my bonus benchmark, right? I'm gonna lose my bonus for this year because I didn't achieve the targeted earning level. How about I do a revaluation, right? I'm gonna revaluate my land, you know, <laughs> to, a, to be a higher value so I can recognize some gains. So that's gonna boost up my earning, right? So you, you right. see why they don't like, they don't like uh, they go, they uh, recognize the, uh, the surplus through the income statement, okay? If you have valuation surplus, that has to go to the equity uh, mm -hmm. through the OCI, yeah. Okay. Does that make that sense? Makes... Yeah. yeah, so first you have to understand the why, right? There must be a reason for this, right? They are not just trying to make your life tougher, mm -hmm. right? Accounting students have an easy life. Let's give them more, you know, challenging rules. Um, there's a reason. Must you, you have to understand this, right? That helps you to uh, solve the problem. Okay, so let's do some questions. Do you believe you know how to do this now? Okay, if you know, I'm gonna stop. We're gonna do uh, some questions. <laughs> 